thank you for coming and uh, we'll have moderated question and answer after uh, Barbara's presentation and uh, I'll have Brittany uh, do an introduction. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the Technology Management Programs Lecture Series. Our keynote speaker, as you heard, is Barbara Grant. Um, she is a partner with American River Ventures. It's an early stage um, venture capital firm. And prior to that, her career included the C being the CEO of Cirrus Technologies and also 21 years at IBM. Um, Barbara holds a BS in chemistry from Arizona State as well as a PhD from um, Stanford in organic chemistry. So our theme for tonight's lecture is Emerging Technology Ventures, What is the Next Transformation? So please join me in welcoming Barbara Grant. Okay, I can think this thing is working. I'm always nervous at a podium that you can see me, I'm so short, but uh, hopefully you can. Hopefully you can see the charts, that's more important. First off, let me start by thanking Bill and Brittany for the invitation to uh, come today. I've had a great visit, got to talk with a lot of interesting people and meet a number of the uh, members of your faculty and student population, it's been great. So as Brittany said, I'm a partner in a venture capital fund, American River Ventures. We're headquartered in Sacramento, California. We're the largest venture capital fund in Sacramento. And we manage $100 million of management and we invest in early stage technology companies. And you're gonna learn a little bit about our companies as we go through uh, uh, this presentation. We, when we say we invest in early stage companies, that means that we might invest in something coming out of a university such as UC Santa Barbara. Uh, about a year ago, we made an investment in a company you'll hear about momentarily in, out of UC Davis. Uh, companies are usually pre-revenue, usually have a very compelling technology advantage or technology story addressing significant market uh, opportunities and with a significant value proposition. We typically invest two to three million dollars in that company initially and reserve to do that amount or a little bit more than that amount again. We have 17 companies we've invested in to date and we'll probably invest in another two or three. Could be one of yours uh, after, uh, if we would have an opportunity. As Brittany said, my background is I've worked in a large company, IBM, for 21 years. I've run a small venture-funded company as a CEO for five years, and then about three and a half years ago joined American River. And I live in Davis, California, and I work very closely with that, that UC school in the UC system. So I was asked to talk about the theme of technology investing in 2008 and beyond under the general charter of your, uh, of your session of the, the technology management program, and that is technology and society. And I thought I would try to share with you the vision that we have at American River of how we anticipate what technologies we should be investing in in 2008 and beyond, and the framework we use to think about what those opportunities might be. And we think of it as looking for opportunities to invest in big transformations. And so that raises the question of what is the next great transformation in which venture capital opportunity to make significant returns uh, exist? Well, to anticipate and think about what the next great transformation is, it's helpful to me and to our firm to think about prior technological transformations. And I'm gonna try something with you tonight to see if you can begin to think about this problem the way we think about this problem. And hopefully, uh, this is a much younger audience than I ordinarily speak to. Hopefully you can relate to the way I think about this problem. So I think the last great technological transformation was the race for space. Now, these look like really antiquated rockets, not the kind of things you've been seeing lately, but this was the genre of 1970. Why was there a race for space? Why was there this transformation that I'm going to focus on here for a few minutes? Well, there was a recognized threat at the time that the race started. And maybe some of you might recognize Khrushchev, I hope. Some of you might recognize Sputnik. But with the launching of Sputnik, certainly there was a fear in the United States that we had lost the technological edge and had to respond. 
So we had a threat. We had a very clear, very visible, very recognized threat. Now, what was the technology base that we had to solve or, or address that threat and address that opportunity? Well, it was pretty antiquated in today's times. Just look at an IBM computer a la 1960 when this threat hit, uh, hit uh, the United States uh, in, in the face. What airplanes looked like, what rockets looked like, what televisions looked like in 1960, what radios and cars looked like. These were the, that was the technology base that we had to start addressing this recognized threat and, and what became the foundation of, well, I think, a very significant transformation. So we had a threat, we had a technology base. We also had government leadership in the form of, many of you may recall or have heard of, very significant challenge placed to spearhead this transformation, and that was Kennedy's statement that before the decade of the 60s is out, we will put a man on the moon. So we had threat, we had a technology base to begin to respond to the threat, and we had government leadership. Now, are there parallels that we can think about and anticipate technological investment opportunities and opportunities for next great transformations? We believe the race this time is the race for energy sustainability. And it's a global race, as opposed to the United States responding to a threat to our country. The threat today is global warming. The threat today is pollution of the environment. Military unrest threatening uh, the, uh, supply reserves. And of course, just the mere availability and continued demand for energy. Different kind of threat, but nonetheless a recognized threat and an increasingly recognized threat. What's the technology base that we have to address the, this transformation and address the threat now? Well, it's a lot more advanced and it's in fact a pretty darn impressive and exciting list of which I'm just illustrating a few here. And if you think about it, it would appear that we're a lot better prepared to address this threat than we were to address that in 1960. Now the leadership is global, as opposed to coming from within our own company, a country, excuse me. You have outspoken thought leaders winning Nobel Prizes in recognizing this threat in Al Gore. Gore makes the point that sometimes we emphasize the danger in a crisis without focusing on the opportunities that are there. And that's what venture capital tries to do, is tries to look for opportunities that come out of threats, come out of crisis, come out of opportunities for transformation. But it is global. We have the governor of California, and you're going to hear a recurring theme in my mind and in our firm's mind that California is uniquely situated to be a leader in spearing this transformation. But it's not just in the U.S. Australia setting very, very ambitious goals for energy management in their country. First country to ban incandescent light bulbs by a certain date to address greenhouse gas emissions. China albeit not an early adopter of all of these technologies, recognizes through the Kyoto Protocol that they and their country has to prepare for climate change and uh, power, uh, power conservation and alternative sources of energy. Japan, similarly, has taken a strong position on what they're going to have to do to meet emissions reductions going forward. And of course, Germany, just to mention a few, that are setting very ambitious goals for their country. So we have a recognized threat, an increasingly uh, appreciated recognized threat. We have a technology base from which to address this. We have leadership stimulating and providing uh, the framework for addressing these problems. But let's go back to that last great transformation that I started out with, the race for space. And let's go back and think about what happened and how we might anticipate how this race for energy sustainability might uh, materialize over the next few years. Well, in the race for space back in 1960, we thought of it as a rocket problem initially. And so you had a few companies recognizing it as a rocket property uh, problem that led the beginning of this technological revolution. Companies like Boeing, Hughes, Aerojet, what is now McDonnell Douglas. But they were focusing on it as a rocket problem. <coughs> Now, today, the, the uh, race for energy sustainability has some of those same attributes. 
we think of it as an energy supply problem. And our companies are leading the charge from that point of view. Companies like Chevron, British Petrol Petroleum, Duke, Shell, et cetera. They, but we're thinking about it again as a supply problem. But let's go back again. Hope you can stay with me flipping back and forth in these perspectives. And I would submit that a really funny thing happened as we went on our way to the moon. And that is that technology solutions and the need for technological solutions to really solve that problem got really complicated. Because we basically had to get from a rocket to a system, to a solution, to uh, a, te a wave of technological innovations. If you go to NASA's website and look for attributions of technology development that were stimulated by the race to the moon, it's an unbelievable list of technological developments of things we use in our everyday life as just simple items of, uh, of uh, daily operation. Flat panel TVs, ceramics, freeze dried foods, fire resistant materials, lasers, lubricants, I mean I'm just picking off a few, iodine based water treatments, thermoelectric technology for cooling, portable cooling, shock absorbing helmets, magnetic bearing systems, things that we use propagated throughout commercial products and uh, for home and industrial use came out of the investments that were made to solve this problem, to address this imminent threat. And the list would go on. I just picked some to illustrate the point. When you ended the 60s and you'd landed a man on the moon, thousands of companies had either jumped into that race to develop technology necessary or even uh, became companies out of that decade, that companies that hadn't existed but had an idea, had a solution, and uh, got themselves into the marketplace. Now, we believe that it's going to get complicated again in the race for energy sustainability. And I want to try to now digress for a moment and talk about our perspective of why it's going to get complicated and where those technological innovations are going to need to come from. So many of you have probably seen graphs like this. This is from the International Energy Association report as late as 2004, but they do it every year and it looks like this every year. What is shown here is from 1971 to 2030, the worldwide demand in millions of tons of oil equivalent for energy that's expected. And of course, we're right now about right here, and this is through 2030. And you can just see the 60% compound growth rate continuing as demand for energy to meet the growth of the economy in the world, to meet the demand for energy in the world of all sources. Now what's shown here is how they anticipate that energy will be provided based on investments that are being made. And it's in the form of coal, oil, gas, nuclear, hydro, other biomass. I want to show you a slightly different version of this graph. And this is that same consumption curve, demand for energy that needs to be supplied to meet our needs. This is how much of it might be provided based on current investments if they're successful by alternative energy sources. So by the year 2030, only 15%, roughly, of the world's demand for energy that's projected will be addressed by all of the various sources of alternative energy that are being developed. Wind, solar, biomass, et cetera. Conventional energy will still dominate the landscape. We will still have the problems that are currently re the recognized threat given rise by the, the shape of this curve and the dominating supply of that energy by conventional energy sources. So our view is that the money needs to be spent not in driving this curve up exclusively, but the, the supply curve of alternative energy sources, but in driving the demand for energy down. Not necessarily by slowing the economy down, not necessarily by reducing productivity, but sustaining all of those activities, but making those activities more energy efficient. And that's the area that we believe is the opportunity for substantial technological innovation and financial returns, is the companies that can uh, provide technologies to turn that curve over. So, 
couple of points I want to make on that. We believe in this next great transformation, a race for energy sustainability, like in the race for space, there will be many, many new technologies and applications that are needed. We believe that the energy curve that I showed you on that previous chart, the demand for energy has to be driven down, that dynamic has to change, and it's going to take innovations in materials, intelligent energy management systems, intelligent software systems, sensors, wireless technologies, you name it. Just a, a string much like the one you saw of, thing, of technologies that are either being used in other markets that can be ported to this problem or technologies that have yet to be invented. We also believe in this case, as in the past, government will stimulate the solution to these problems in some cases. In some cases by policy, you saw the, the uh, German government or the Australian government saying no more incandescent light bulbs. Some of you may have seen, <coughs> excuse me, some of you may have seen just a couple of weeks ago, the Prime Minister of Australia said he may ban flat panel TVs because they're too energy consuming. That wouldn't be very popular in the United States, but it's a very good example of government providing incentives and policies to restrict the consumption of energy. Now what he's really saying, and I'll get back to this in a minute, is give me technological solutions to flat panel TVs that are less energy consuming. That's the right way to solve that problem. This has also been recognized as an opportunity for substantial venture capital return on investment. And in some cases, it's been suggested that it might be akin to the kind of returns you saw in the early days of the personal computer and internet transformations. So significant financial returns. Technologies will be valued, at very significant uh, return on investment. Now, another point that I'd like to make that we believe is that California is a significant player in this race for energy sustainability. We're the seventh largest economy in the world. We have significant government leadership pushing the vanguard of uh, energy cons conservation and in alternative energy investments. And the UC system, as we talked about at lunch today, I think has an opportunity to really be a significant provider of technology and also leader in the adoption of technologies for energy uh, efficiencies and energy conservation. Now, what I thought I would do is take some time to tell you about four companies in our portfolio that we believe are the kinds of companies that can help turn that curve over. And uh, then we can, in the Q&A session, we can come back and certainly you're welcome to ask questions about this. I guess questions have to come later. All right, let me tell you about the first company, Clairvoyant. Clairvoyant has a technology it's primarily in the form of intellectual property and software that allows you to lay out the picture elements of a flat panel liquid crystal display screen in a different manner that's tuned the human visual system more effectively. And the net result of that is it can reduce the power consumed for a, any given liquid crystal display by approximately 50%. Now, is that significant? Well, it is significant because uh, flat panel TVs, or certainly TVs, I should say, but increasingly that's made up of flat panel TVs, make up 4% of the demand for energy in the United States today. And that's a mind-boggling number. And that number is growing percentage-wise every year. But 4% of the electricity we consume in this country and countries around the world typically are in that also in that same, uh, same range are driving television sets. So if you could provide a technology that could reduce that by a factor of two, you'd reduce the demand for electricity by 2%. That's a big, big number if you could in fact impact the entire uh, market. Now another thing that's interesting about that is that's if, literally, if you could do that, that's 10 times the power generation of the Bonneville Dam, which is one of the largest water generation sources in the United States. Now, um, Clairvoyant is an example of a company whose technology primarily serves the consumer market. So for you and I to reap the benefits of this technology in the form of turning that demand curve over, 
all of us have to adopt the technology enabled by clairvoyant, which is a much harder market to penetrate because it's millions and millions and millions of buyers or consumers. Our focus typically is on providing solutions like this to the industrial and manufacturing sector, and the next companies I'm going to tell you about uh, address that market. And the reason for that is <coughs> that over half of the energy consumed in the world is consumed by industries, uh, industrial and manufacturing companies. So they are the opportunity to have the biggest effect. Is they, they represent such a huge portion of the energy consumption to begin with. So let me tell you about a case study that you might be able to relate to here at UC Santa Barbara, and maybe UC Santa Barbara in the not too distant future will be using this product. This company, a Clairvoyant, is located in the Bay Area, and uh, Qity is located in Mission Viejo, and they provide a software platform that allows manufacturing facilities or uh, industrial complexes or campuses or large accumulations of buildings and facilities to manage the uh, properties to the advantage of energy consumption. So what did they do? The case study here is Rice University. Rice University's electricity bill was something on the order of 12 to 13 million dollars a year. And, <coughs> excuse me, sorry, that's not a good place for that microphone, I guess. Um, what the GenQt software allowed them to do is to tie together the building air conditioning system, the classroom schedules, their energy generation and cogeneration facilities, and the weather, so that each room in the buildings on the campus, if a class was being held, then that room was air conditioned. If class wasn't in session in that room in that building, then that building that room would be taken offline and not brought back on until say 30 minutes before the next class. If it was going to be a cool day, all the buildings would be set to control the air conditioning to whatever the weather was going to be that day through the connection into the weather system. The implementation of this technology in Rice University saved them over a million dollars a year in electricity out of their roughly $12 million uh, electricity bill. So it's a significant, in the, or in the order of 10% reduction in electricity, you can imagine propagating that across all campuses and all industrial facilities around the world, you would probably see fairly substantial turnover of that curve when you realize that these are the types of facilities that consume half or more of the energy in the world. We're currently introducing uh, Inquity to uh, UC Davis and several other UC systems and trying to work with the utility companies in California to uh, have them assist in the deployment of this technology in campuses in California and in industrial facilities in California. SynapseSense actually is a spin out of UC Davis that we invested in about a year ago. And SynapseSense has a wireless sensor network that some of you may be familiar with, certainly in the computer science and EE curricula that I'm sure you've come across these types of technologies. And they're targeting the deployment of their proprietary wireless sensor networks into large uh, commercial data centers. Uh, a commercial data center such as uh, IBM's or Google's or Yahoo's or uh, Microsoft, Oracle, Intel, any of these large consumer, large industrial complexes that have large computing systems. UC Santa Barbara, I'm sure, has a large data center. Just the uh, facility I was in this afternoon, obviously, has a large data center. Um, Data centers, you know, I mentioned that televisions consume about 4% of the electricity in the United States today. Data centers consume about 2%, and that number is growing very, very rapidly as the deployment of additional and high, high uh, in computer intensive applications on the internet are certainly driving uh, that curve up very high. SynapseSense so enables data centers to manage their air conditioning environment much more effectively using sensors deployed all throughout the data center that's providing real-time, inexpensively real-time information about what's going on in the data center and they can air condition all the uh, various air conditioning units more effectively and have demonstrated in multiple customer environments anywhere from 20 to 50 percent reduction in, in uh, electrical power consum consumption, which is again a very significant, uh, significant uh, reduction. You could imagine taking this out into semiconductor manufacturing fabs, into campuses, again, a myriad of energy consuming places. Anywhere you have air conditioning 
and high variability in the um, in the consumption and uh, the amount of air conditioning that needs to be provided. The last example I'm going to give you is a company also in California, Rancho Cucamonga, in the LA basin, um, Spectra Sensors. Spectra Sensors has a laser spectroscopy technology platform that they deploy in uh, the sensing of a gas in the presence of other gases. For example, water uh, in the presence of natural gas, which is a, sor a big source of corrosion in natural gas pipelines leading to leaks and, and uh, substantial risk issues in the natural gas infrastructure in around the world. They also can measure uh, moisture in air. They can measure, which is critical to metrological forecasting, weather forecasting. They can measure H2S in the presence of uh, uh, exhaust fumes in petrochemical plants. And their particular sensors are designed to be very robust for industrial applications, really hardcore uh, applications where the sensor is uh, itself exposed to substantial and, and harsh conditions. This company is doing very, very well and uh, seeing substantial growth and adoption of their technologies in a wide variety of markets. Again, it's helping, for example, chemical plants operate more efficiently, have less exhaust, and also in the course of operating more efficiently, you use less energy. So um, I want to close by making a couple of points. This is sort of a silly title, but it really is quite the way we think about it. That if you, if you look for investment opportunities or, or market opportunities, if you're trying to start a business, and you go in search of what will be significant transformations in the world, again, we submit the race for energy sustainability is just such a race, a, a transformation. The mere chase of that opportunity is a very transforming event. The world is very different today. Our products that we use, the products that our uh, campuses use, our companies use, our transportation systems use, is markedly different today because of the race for space. And as we go out five, 10 years from now, the world will be markedly different because of the race for energy sustainability. And all of those technologies won't just be being used in chasing that demand curve or chasing that supply curve, they will, be, they will propagate throughout all of our lives and all of the products that we consume and, and, and use. And an, an example here is just, we started out thinking it was a rocket problem and we developed technologies that allowed you to live and operate and function in space. Mission control looked pretty rudimentary at the end of the 1960s decade when we landed a man on the moon versus what it looks like today and the amount of technology and transformation that went on on that. But there's probably no example more significant of how technology was transformed than just in the suit that the space, uh, uh, the, the uh, space, space man, I don't want to say space man, astronaut, thank you. <laughs> You're going to edit that part out, right, guys? Uh, the astronaut war, which was a very rudimentary plastic sheet, a bubble suit, et cetera, and what's now used in the, uh, in the space shuttle and, and the uh, International Space Station is just a phenomenal marvel of technology. Every square inch of that spacesuit is a technological invention that didn't exist at the beginning of the race for space. The last point I would make is that we find quite profound about thinking about the next great transformation, the race for energy sustainability, and reflecting on what it was like coming out of the race for space, is that obviously our firm believes that the opportunity for investment is driving that demand curve down and driving, making the consumption of energy a much more efficient um, and uh, effective the technology to make the consumption of energy more efficient and more effective. And in the end, the irony of this is the thing that limits us from further advancing space exploration is the consumption of energy. We have to get batteries more efficient. We have to get technologies more efficient. We have to get computers less, more power efficient. We have to get spacesuits more power efficient. We have to get solar cells more power efficient and more effective in order to continue even the race for space opportunity that was begun in the 1960s. So suffice it to say that we're devout believers that energy efficiency is the investment opportunity for 2008 and beyond. 
and that the race for s energy sustainability will be the transforming and unifying initiative that makes that all happen. Thank you, and I'd be happy to take questions. Very uh, positive overview, and, and we've got a lot of folks in the room who are a little younger than us. <laughs> and I'd like you to share a little bit of, of your perspective, uh, not only from technology, but a belief system as to why is it that we feel that you we can go forward with technology and resolve some of these very grave issues? Well, I. You know, I, again, I, I was really hesitant to use this race for space analogy with this crowd because, as I said, it's a little bit younger crowd than I usually talk to. But you, you would have never believed in 1960 we would have a man on the moon in 1970 by the end of that decade. You, it was truly one of the most ludicrous challenges at the time that anybody could imagine when Kennedy said, at the end of the decade, I want a man on the moon. But it was galvanizing. And the kinds of things that are going on in the race for energy sustainability and the difference now being it's a global galvanizing effect. And if, if anything, the U.S. is behind, I think, in being uh, truly incented and stimulated to take this challenge on. But the, the, the difficulties look no less foreboding that we can turn that curve over, that we can become less dependent on fossil fuels, that we can find cleaner fossil fuels, that we can find technologies that really make us able to close this equation. But you look at the opportunities that are out there, the companies that are already beginning that, that chase, and I really do come away completely convinced that it's doable, and completely convinced that it's doable in the time frame of 2030. But it starts with really exciting companies that start tackling these problems in 2007 and 2008. But um, I, I'm quite optimistic about that. And if you can find a technology that can reduce the consumption of energy in a TV by 50%, that's a big knob. A data center by 20 to 50%, those are huge knobs. And the point I was trying to make to you is the things we use in our everyday life drive large, they're large wedges in our demand for energy. Uh, we just have to look at them and say, how can I do that more efficiently? And it's easier to think about attacking, reducing the consumption of power in televisions if it's 4% than replacing incandescent light bulbs with complex, com compact fluorescents. We need to do that, but it's a smaller incremental fix every time you do it. It's important to do it, but there are some big knobs out there and we need to be looking for technological solutions to those problems. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Um, the fact that you said uh, the energy sustenance mode that that you're t trying to target is that is that some kind of a uh, a short range solution, or do you think it's a it it applies in the long run? That trying to turn the demand mm -hmm. curve down. Mm -hmm. I think it has to be a long term objective, but. I believe we have to look at it as a very tactical problem because we need to start turning it over now. Uh, we can't wait another decade of continued growth at 60% and then start worrying about it. The other point I should have made and I didn't on that graph is if I go build a solar facility to provide a kilowatt hour a year of additional demand or in a supply of energy, so a kilowatt hour for a whole year. It costs me about $3.50 of capital equipment to build that solar facility per kilowatt hour per year. So a kilowatt hour per year is a thousand watt light bulb operating for a year, right? Or that's, you know, not, you guys know that. If I go and take, for example, Synapsense's software, the wireless sensor network, and I install that in a data center, and I save a kilowatt hour a year, that same kilowatt hour a year that my solar fab was providing me as additional energy, it costs two cents a kilowatt hour. So $3.50 to create more energy per unit, or two cents to save that energy. But it's the same thing. We either have to save it or we have to build more. 
and our emphasis is on the saving of it. And I do believe it's a long-term part of our, you know, the focus of the country and the focus of the world has been on gross national product and productivity. It needs to be on gross national product, productivity, and efficient use of energy. And it needs to stay that way forever uh, or else, but we need to start now. In order for that to happen, is there going to have to be like another um, an analogy to Sputnik, like for energy? Because I feel like global warming has been watered down so much that nobody really cares as much as they did about Sputnik, and maybe something has to happen for people to really get in behind it. Or well, I think that's why I tried to make the point that it's in this case it's it's not a threat to just the U.S. and it's not just a single threat like Sputnik was to the U.S. And, and what launched the race for space. This is global warming to the extent that it's, you're persuaded by the arguments or not. It's oil prices, it's oil supplies, it's uh, contamination of the atmosphere. How many of you saw the article in the paper three or four weeks ago, it was in the San Francisco Chronicle of the huge plume of plastic that's floating around in the ocean, out in the Pacific Ocean, because it's just caught in this big whirlpool, and it's the size of Texas. I mean, it's just scary to think of these things, right? So I think the problems are so tangible, whether it be the quality of the air in Pasadena or the size of the plastic sinkhole that we've created in the Pacific, or belief or, or skepticism about global warming or the oil at $100 a gallon and um, uh, not $100 a gallon, excuse me, didn't say that right. Um, but or, or the fact that where the oil supplies are and where the, where the energy supplies are are not necessarily the most stable uh, geographies in the world. All of those things I think come into play to make this more than just a single threat. And I do believe that the U.S. is being s relatively slow to get galvanized on this compared to some of our counterparts of the type that I mentioned in Australia, Germany, et cetera. Anybody else have a question? Good questions. Um, <coughs> uh, the space program was entirely a government activity. Um, do you see this uh, energy conservation program, the role of the government to encourage the development of the technology or to encourage the use of the technology? Well, I think that's a very interesting difference in this case in that I don't think this is solely going to be uh, stimulated and funded by government in the same way that the race for space was. The, but I will make a point about the role of government in energy efficiency and clean energy and alternative energies. And I was talking about this at lunch. And uh, hopefully this will make sense to you. When, uh, you know, if you could think back to major technological revolutions that have occurred in the last 10 or 15 years, you have the uh, mainframe computer, you have the laptop, you have the cell phone, you have the internet, telecommunications, these types of technological revolutions. I call them revolutions, not necessarily transformations, because they were sort of uh, each a bit vertically, vertically impacted society in their own way, cell phones, mobility. But if you went into a Starbucks and the person next to you had the absolutely most advanced cell phone or had the Citrino dual red hot laptop or whatever, and you ask that person, hey, that's cool, what do you do for a living? And they said, well, I'm a government employee. Uh, you guys probably aren't yet taxpayers, but taxpayers generally reacted to that by saying, oh, I don't, I don't know that I want my taxpayer money to give the leading edge cell phone to a state employee. You know, we were, we were not completely convinced that's what we wanted the state spending money on. But if you go and you see a fire station with solar cells on it, you see a government employee using very energy efficient uh, air conditioning systems in their data centers. We as taxpayers believe that is a good use of our money. We want the government to be leading the charge in the 
sustainable, race for energy sustainability because they're a huge consumer of that energy. Phenomenally large part of the, uh, of the purchase of energy. And so I do believe in this case, government will be an early adopter. Government will be a source of the market. The government will, m spending will be buying these products and making these trans this transformation happen. And we will embrace that as taxpayers. We will want the government to be saving our energy every way they can and to playing as smart as they can. So I don't think it'll come necessarily just from policy. It won't come from funding. It'll come from consumption. They are big consumers and we want them to, to be operating as effectively as they can in this space. So that's our vision of this. And we do believe that part of the reason that B California is so significant is because Sacramento has very advanced thinking in state government on this issue. They're not debating global warming. They're embracing it and trying to solve it. And they're taking on some very s significant programs to try to, to solve this problem. Much more so in the United States than many other states. And they will lead and they will be a significant player. Yes. Are the uh, Europeans uh, looking no, to- No, we have a question here. Yeah, no, it's a question for you. Yeah. We have a question here. Yeah. <laughs> Europeans looking to California and not Washington for leadership on sustainable energy issues. Do you see that playing into broader opportunity for some of the young people in the room here as they build their careers and create opportunities and new ventures? Yeah, absolutely. I cannot emphasize enough how I think, Cali we believe California, companies that have innovative technologies that can make a huge difference in the consumption of energy and energy sustainability will come through California and will come through Sacramento to make their businesses successful. And uh, I think the companies being located in California will be very critical. I think we can become a very significant player in this, in this industry. We already are becoming. And it's a natural advantage that we have. And we should be very thankful we have uh, government leadership right now in the state that is, in fact, embracing this aggressively. Otherwise, it would be the advantage of our counterparts in countries that are clearly also advan advancing this in terms of job creation, technological invention, and funding. Here, sorry. Um, I was going to ask, because I, I think it's absolutely a valid argument that government consumption of energy efficient technologies is going to drive this transformation. The, the question I have is basically a short term versus a long term economic standpoint because if, if a firm looks at replacing their entire lighting system with a much more energy efficient system that will pay itself back in 15 years but they don't want to incur the capital cost of having to replace that entire entire infrastructure. And so then also the people who are managing these various divisions, a lot of times their performance incentives are tied to how well they meet certain budgets. Mm -hmm. And so they don't want to incur these kinds of costs or they don't want to adopt these technologies that would be better off for the firm in the long run, but the decision makers in charge of those, uh, 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 in charge of that, uh, they're not going to be working for that company in 15 years. So that is a great point. I hope everybody could hear that. Um, you have to look, when you're going to look for re significant opportunities to create value, you have to look at this question of return. How, what is the time to return on investment? You know, if I go build a new dam, it's a 20-year return on investment. I put $20 billion into building the dam, and I get that back <laughs> over a 20, 25-year period, assuming I can find a place to even locate it create that additional energy, which is becoming harder and harder. Same thing on a solar facility. Very long, many, many year return on investment. What we look for are software technologies or materials technologies that have return on investments to their customers of two to three months. If you install the Inquity software at Rice University, they paid for that software in less than 45 days in savings of energy bills that they wrote to their utility company. Uh, that is absolutely critical, I think, to, um, to this. Now, there is a problem, an infrastructure problem, that is one that you can't ignore as you're thinking about creating businesses and business plans and solving 
these kind of problems. The problem you have in that case that I just described is the guy or the person that runs the data center or runs the campus yeah, uh, from a maintenance and facilities point of view in the case of Rice University or the data center of IBM isn't the person that writes the check for the electricity bill, right? And the electricity might not even be in their budget. So you do end up having to solve the problem of the guy who wants, to, wants the product doesn't necessarily get the return on investment because their budget didn't have the electricity bill. So this is a tricky part about energy efficiency. And it is, that's why it's going to be so important for there to be a belief we have to solve these problems, right? Because then it will, it will be solved by the, by the top level management of the company because they know they have to get their energy consumption down. The other nice thing about what's happening in California, and this is again a leadership position in California, is what the utility companies are doing, which is incenting, you know, it's the most amazing thing that's going on if you think about it, they are incenting with cash their customers not to use their product, right? And think about it. I mean, there aren't very many places where that would happen. But they will, if you could go buy the Synapsense product, could put in a data center, and you're in a PG&E um, or SoCal Edison location, they'll pay for half the product. And you're going to buy less product from them because you're using less energy. But they are truly um, both legislated to and uh, have established a business philosophy to try to reduce the consumption of energy, which is their product. I mean, it's a pretty amazing thing. Again, California being a very significant leader in that uh, adoption of that thought process. But very good point. That return on investment point is very critical. And uh, that's why we look for investments that have very clear, short, incremental cost to, to, to get the savings and very fast return on investment. Questions? Uh, yep. Okay. Um, my question was... Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I was just kind of interested. I know the last thing that you talked about was saying that the main issue here is that we need funding for more R&D for more efficient energy sources and such. And we all know that the government isn't necessarily um, budgeting or making huge changes in their budge budget um, to fund these types of research. I was just curious to see, um, as a venture capitalist, how much of an effect do you think, like, money-wise, you guys have in contributing to research and development? Like, is this a popular area? Um, now or, you know, where is most of this money going to be coming from? Well, it is a very hot area for investment right now, both in the venture capital community, private equity capital, um, not so much government. Government is spending money buying the products to save, but they're not spending money necessarily to, um, to stimulate research and development. Now, I would say that government spends huge sums building more energy sources, you know, building dams, building solar facilities, uh, building wind, faci wind farms and that sort of thing, biomass farms. So that's where the big, big dollars go, is in driving that we need more and more supply. And less money is going into we need to consume less. And again, I want to emphasize consume less without reducing the productivity of the economy. You know, we don't want factories to produce less. We want factories to produce the same amount for less unit energy per part that they produce. And, um, you know, I think the money won't be coming from government in this case purely, but government will buy the products, as I said. And it's going to come from venture capital. It's going to come from corporate investment, reinvestment of their profit dollars in themselves and their own development programs and large private equity investments. Good questions, though. Right. Very, very good question. Really good question. I, these are great questions, by the way. I'm very impressed. Um, we do not, first off, let me just give you a slight small, you're going to, I guess you guys have Ann Winblad coming to your next session. 
believe me, it's not easy for me to be on the agenda before Ann Wimbled because she's a god of venture capital. She wins awards right and left. She's she's a phenomenal investor in, in software companies, primarily at Hummer Wimbled. So she'll give you a great understanding of venture capital. But venture capital, we're investing other people's money in the hope of giving them an advantage return. It's a high risk prospect of high return. So we don't hire lobbyists. Now we do have advisors to our fund that understand, might be retired lobbyists, might understand how do you get incentive programs in place, uh, might uh, have in fact influenced policy in their prior uh, careers. So we do seek out the advice and counsel and, and in fact have formal advisors from that community. A good example of, um, I, see, I'm trying to think of how to describe this. A, a real interesting <coughs> situation now in, um, let's say you you put in, uh, you buy a services of a solar facility to run a Staples uh, office supply store. And you're going to claim that carbon credits, because you're doing that with solar, right? Are you guys familiar at all with this phenomenon? Well, there's a, a piece of legislation that was put in place that said the only way you can do that is if a third party verifies that you, in fact, used that solar and you saved carbon. Then you can claim uh, carbon credits on it. But it has to be a third party verification. Well, there are companies now coming up that are providing the software for that third party verification because that's a new business opportunity. It didn't used to have to happen. Legislation said it has to be third party verified. And so software designers jump into that market see that opportunity and provide that solution. We actually have as advisor to our fund, the gentleman who wrote that legislation you know, as part of a, a lobbying activity. So we don't hire them, we don't have any of them on our staff, but we do understand that being in Sacramento is an advantage for us because we can, we can work with that community, we can understand what's coming, and that's what we try to bring as an advantage to our companies is uh, understanding that process. So in terms of uh, saving the energy, how much of a market does uh, exist in the end user in terms of you know, uh, energy con reducing energy consumption at homes and hotels? and is, is there a market at all there? Absolutely. Absolutely a market there. Um, we don't tend to focus on it as much, the retail or the residential or, uh, again, because we're looking for big you know, software platforms or materials platforms that can can make a big effect selling to fewer customers type of thing. But I mean, look at um, uh, the whole compact fluorescent light bulb, right? That's a huge uh, residential energy efficiency savings. And you're seeing a lot of incentives out there to encourage us to replace incandescence with that. You're seeing some governments such as Australia saying, I'm just going to ban incandescence. We can't sell them anymore. Um, you're seeing more and more new homes uh, that are being built, sort of greenfield home uh, construction uh, from the ground up, putting in pretty substantial energy innovations in the air conditioning system, control systems, monitoring systems. We were talking about it, even lighting systems are beginning, lighting control systems to automatically control when you're in and out of a room, that sort of thing. The challenge in there are some venture capital firms that really love to sell to the retail, to invest in companies that sell to the retail market, and there's others like ours that tend to stay away from selling to that because it's, it's a harder market to penetrate. You really have to know how to do that very well. But there are huge energy efficient savings. Lighting is a big, big opportunity for home. And even further advances, I think, are going to be coming in lighting that will, beyond the, the CFL, that will be quite significant. Air conditioning systems. Another big consumer of electricity. Um, another interesting, and we were talking about this also at lunch, is in, in New England, there are now some, some um, utility companies that when they're having trouble meeting the demand for energy on their grid, like Cal ISO here in California, when there's too much demand in the summer and they don't have enough uh, energy to supply on the California grid, in, in the Northeast, they actually now have <coughs> Sorry about that. I'm going to have to cut this out. <coughs> <coughs> I'm 
Bill, maybe you could answer that question. <coughs> Excuse me. Sorry about that. I knew that might happen after about an hour. That they can actually, the utility company, can reach down into your home and electronically turn off your water heater so that the water heater is not draining off the grid and they can then provide to their commercial customers. Well, that's a really interesting technology to have curbside control of electronically turning on and off a water heater. Great residential energy efficiency application. I looked at a company the other day that was developed and said, okay, that's interesting, but customers don't really want their water heater turned off. A lot of customers don't like feeling that that's ha that can happen and then they have no recourse. So there's, this company is providing some really in innovative um, inverters that you can put in your house that when that happens, it just immediately provides power to your water heater. So the signal from the energy, the utility company comes in, turn that water heater off and it's bypassed into this inverter and the inverter provides energy for a, some period of time, some short period of time to the water heater. All of these are great energy efficiency savings and uh, innovations that we're just going to see more and more and more of these kind of things, and many of them will be in the home, like that one. Brett's going to give a formal thank you, too, but uh, February 8th and 9th, uh, we will be discussing <coughs> many of these elements at our annual energy conference, and uh, hope uh, you and some of your colleagues from Sacramento might join us for that. Uh, <coughs> but thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, thank you. Very much appreciated. Thank you, guys.